What is the conventional current? Why do we use it? And why is it okay to do so? We know that in a simple circuit consisting of a battery and a resistor, negatively charged particles called electrons flow from the negative pole of the battery to the positive pole. But the current is always represented flowing the other way, from plus to minus. This is what we call the conventional current. It can be seen as representing the flow of hypothetical positively charged particles flowing from the positive pole to the negative pole of the battery. Why do we do that? Why do we use a model that is not an accurate representation of what's going on? The reason lies within the history of the discovery of electricity, and this is what we will address in the first section of this video. The second section of this video will discuss on why it is okay to use the conventional current model in electrical sciences, even though it is not an accurate description of reality. As you all know, physics is the exploration of how the universe works. And, as with any ongoing investigation, some observations can be misleading. That is what happened to Benjamin Franklin in the 1740s. Benjamin Franklin was an incredibly resourceful man. As a politician, he had a significant influence on the early development of the United States of America. He was also a leading writer of his time. Finally, he was an amazing inventor and scientist. One of his achievements was to place humanity on the right path to understanding electricity. But with a twist. The model he came up with was just kind of upside down. In the 18th century, phenomena related to electricity had already been observed. But these were still considered a little bit like magic. Franklin put an end to this. He carried out multiple experiments, and from his observations, he suggested that electricity must be a kind of invisible fluid that could flow between bodies. Some objects containing more of that fluid than others. So when the objects got in contact, the fluid would flow from the body containing more of it to the body containing less. That is where Benjamin Franklin defined the concept of charge. When an object is in excess of that fluid, it is positively charged. When there is a lack of that fluid in the object, the object is negatively charged. So, for Mr. Franklin, an electrical current was a flow of positive charges. All further developments in electrical sciences until the late 19th century used this model. But something revolutionary happened in 1897. Thomson's cathodic ray tube experiment. Joseph John Thomson was a British physicist known for the discovery of the electron. He also proposed the plum pudding model of the atom. He discovered isotopes and he invented the mass spectrometer. The experiment that allowed him to discover electrons consisted in placing two electrodes inside a glass container. He set up a tight vacuum in the container and then connected a battery to the electrodes as shown in the diagram. What he observed was a ray originating from the cathode directed towards the anode. Thomson extended his experiment to try and figure out the nature of this ray. He set up positively and negatively charged plates either side of the ray, and the ray got deflected towards the positive plate. He concluded that this ray had to be composed of negatively charged particles. He had just discovered the electron. When he replaced the electric field by a magnetic field, he observed a deviation of the path of these particles consistent with their negative charge. Remember this video. Place a moving charge in a magnetic field, and this charge will experience a magnetic force, F equals QVB. From that, he was able to determine the mass-to-charge ratio of these particles. This led him to realize that electrons were about 2,000 times less massive than the hydrogen atom. Finally, by changing the material of the electrodes, he noted that the properties of the ray coming out of the cathode remained unchanged. These three facts led to the conclusions that atoms contained negative charged particles, the electrons, and that these were the real carriers of electrical charges in a material. 
the problem was that textbooks, all scientific publications, and even the labels on batteries were based on Franklin's model. Think about it. Maxwell equations that summarized the works of Coulomb, Faraday, Ampère, and Lenz, just to name a few, had been published in 1865, 30 years before the discovery of the electron. It was just a huge headache to correct all this. But there was a way out. It didn't matter. All equations still work using Franklin's model. So instead of revising everything, the scientific community just applied a consensual patch, the conventional current, where it is hypothetical positively charged carriers that move in the conductor. Therefore, electricity could still flow from high potentials to low potentials, even though we know that it is negatively charged carriers that flow from low to high potentials. But you might say, hey, wait a minute. How can we be sure that this conventional model for the electrical current is actually perfectly symmetric, thus equivalent to reality? Let's look into this. Imagine some hydrogen atoms placed in a row. On the diagram, let's label them A, B, C, D, E and F. These atoms are electrically neutral. They consist of a proton carrying a charge plus E and an electron carrying a charge minus E. As you probably know, the letter E represents the elementary charge which is equal to 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. Now, let's remove an electron from atom F on the far right. This atom becomes therefore positively charged. The electron on atom E will be attracted by atom F and therefore jump to it. Now it's atom E that is positively charged. Let's repeat the process. The electron on D jumps on atom E, the electron on C jumps on atom D, and so on. Now, let's step back a little. What do we observe? Yes, the electrons are moving from left to right. But in parallel, it appears that a positive charge of magnitude E moves from right to left. You can see that the flow of electrons implies systematically the existence of a conventional current. From that, you can even give a physical meaning to the conventional current. It is a flow of lack of electrons. What about in electrical circuits? Is the conventional current model equivalent to the electron flow model in regards to energy? The purpose of an electrical circuit is to convert energy in a form that suits our needs. For example, when you place a battery in a flashlight, the circuit in the flashlight will convert chemical energy from the battery into light energy. And to do so, it will pass by electrical energy, because electrical energy is the easiest to manipulate. That's why electrical circuits are everywhere. Can you think about other practical energy conversions that circuits provide? Let me know in the comments. To fully understand what is coming up, you need to know precisely what is an electric potential and what is a voltage. If you don't, I invite you to check this video first. Let's consider an electron of charge minus E flowing from an electric potential of say, plus five volts to a potential of minus three volts. In other words, this electron goes through a voltage delta V of minus three, minus five, that is, minus 8 volts. For this to happen, some work needs to be provided to the electron. Yes, 8 joules per coulomb. The potential energy gained by the electron in the process is therefore minus E multiplied by delta V, that is, minus 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 coulomb multiplied by minus 8 volts, which equates to 1.28 by 10 to the minus 18 joules. Good. Now let's see what happens if we consider a conventional current. Imagine a positron charged with plus E coulomb flowing in the opposite direction than the electron did. It flows therefore from a potential of minus 3 volts to a potential of plus 5 volts. In other words, it goes through a voltage of 5 minus minus 3, that is plus 8 volts. If we calculate the gain in potential energy of that positron, we get plus E multiplied by delta V which is 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb multiplied by 8 volts, and it equates to 1.28 by 10 to the minus 18 joules. So you see, the energy provided to the charge carrier is exactly the same whether you consider the electron flow model 
or the conventional current model. Imagine an alien civilization living and evolving on another planet. Its investigation of physics and thus electricity might have taken another path than for humans. For example, their own genius scientists that discovered the nature of electricity might have postulated that electrons are positively charged particles and protons negatively charged particles. This wouldn't have hindered in any way this civilization's technological progress. What I mean here is just saying that an electron is negatively charged is just a human label. But one advantage for this alien civilization is that their high school students probably suffer less from the headaches when studying electrical sciences in physics class. So, in the end, you, as a student, what do you need to take from this, especially when you are studying electricity? Well, if a question asks you to describe in detail the electrical interactions between particles, you know, for example, the how energy is dissipated in a resistor or filament, then stick to the electron flow model, because it is the closest to reality, and therefore your description will be the most accurate. But if you are just solving for circuit quantities like current, voltage, resistance, capacitance, etc., or you are working on practical electrical problems, or you are studying an electronic circuit, where in these situations, stick to the conventional current. This is the model that is used by default in these situations. Voila, that's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and smash this notification bell. It really helps the channel and encourages me in producing and posting new videos. In the meantime, I do wish you the best and I look forward to seeing you for the next episode of Physics Made Easy. Ciao.